The letter to the Colossians was written by the Apostle Paul with his young co-worker Timothy, while Paul was being held in Roman custody. Although Timothy is included in the salutations, it is believed the content is exclusively Paul's. The letter opens with his usual greetings. It is unusual in that Paul had never visited the church when he wrote. Usually his letters were sent to churches in which he was already known personally. When Paul writes to his fellow worker Philemon, he states that he's hoping to visit Colossae at some stage in the future. But there's no firm evidence that this has ever happened. He wrote in response to a visit from Epaphras, the pastor and founder of the church at Colossae. Paul writes to the saints and faithful brethren. Every true Christian is a saint, but not everyone is a faithful brother or sister. Paul may be making a distinction of those who haven't embraced the false teaching that concerned Paul so much in this letter. For those in small or struggling churches, this letter is a great encouragement. Colossae was a very small and insignificant city. Yet Paul thought the situation in Colossae was important enough for apostolic attention. In the first two verses, Paul uses the word brother twice and describes God as our father. We are a spiritual family because we have the same father. God has made us his children in the miracle of new birth. The church is called the household of God. God does not see any children outside his household. As family, we gather and live life together. You do not pick your own family, they're given to you. Similarly, you shouldn't just hop around and change churches like you do clothing. Most people change churches for the wrong reasons and circumvent their own spiritual growth. Not only brothers, but saints. Saints means that we're set apart by God for his purposes. It comes from the Old Testament idea in which God chose Israel out of all the nations to be his special people for his purpose. As a result, they are a holy people and a holy nation. As the people of God, they were to take on the character of God, becoming like him. We are saints in light who have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his Son. Yet they were also in Colossae to be lights who shine in their city. Paul goes on to say that these people had been called to lead a life worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. This is one of the most succinct descriptions of what the life of a disciple of Jesus Christ is to be like. At first glance, this style of life appears to go against our natural inclinations, and it doesn't really seem to be very exciting, fun or appealing. This certainly isn't Paul's view. Paul understands that the life he describes is not one that is attained by discipline and hard work. Rather, it is a life that is the fruit of discovery. There were influences that were attempting to get the Colossian church to add things to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Just like in our world today, there were other gospels being preached. Some are saying that God's love is not so free, but depends on religious rites which must be performed, or the attainment of miscellaneous achievements. We can become busy trying to justify ourselves. We can even make ourselves busy with overwork, even church work, to achieve some sense of being valued and ultimately coming through and finding a place of worth. Paraphrasing the text, Paul is effectively asking these people, will you hold fast to the true word of the gospel? Or will you be seduced by religious fads and philosophical deceits? Paul wants them to be relieved of the stress and anxiety which their various troubles have brought so that they can have joy and thanksgiving. 
Above all, this is about a sense of peace. It depends on believing in God as the one who alone holds the future and makes a place of belonging for us. What is described in Colossians is primarily a description of the reality of the life that is enabled by the Gospel. Paul writes, Giving thanks to the Father, who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption. What Christ has done is, past tense, a completed action. What we have been given by grace through faith is also, past tense, a completed action. The Christian life is not a religious self-improvement program where we strive to become better people. Instead, it's a life of discovery, realising what we have been given and living it its reality. The Christian life is yielding to the empowering, transforming touch of the Holy Spirit. The Gospel is not proclaimed in order to equip or elicit a response. Rather, the fruits of the Christian life are declared in order to proclaim the gospel. The Colossians' faithful living is only possible because faith has been quickened by the word, which has already been preached, and by the power of the Spirit received through faith. Paul is convinced that something is at work within us, transforming ourselves to be conformed to Christ's glorious self. So much of our growth in life is unseen. We're constantly being reformed, reshaped, renewed, remoulded into a fuller human being, or, in Paul's language, growing into the fullness of Christ. Keeping our eyes on Jesus and his love opens us up to the creative movement of the Holy Spirit, which enables us to be transformed and to let our light shine in the darkness. Paul then emphasises the mighty power of the Almighty God by focusing on creation. He says, For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, All things have been created through him and for him. A true understanding is truly mind-blowing. To believe in the evolution of the galaxy underlines how tiny and insignificant man is. But to realise that the same God who created the heavens and the earth also created you shows how special and significant you are in God's eyes. God knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. He has plans for you, and nothing concerning God is by chance. It actually takes more faith to not believe in God than to believe. Common sense tells us that these things cannot just happen. Nature is God's creation. It is too complex to just happen. You must find your purpose that God intended for you to live out your life in the way God intended. You were created to love God with your whole heart, mind, soul and body. You were created for a purpose. You were created to have dignity. Find your purpose and execute your purpose in your life and you will not find your purpose without God. We are to develop the character of God in our lives, to become more like Christ in our thinking, priorities, in how we respond to the stress of life. God wants a relationship with us and desires for us to have relationships with others in that order. God wants us to be more like Christ. We are made in his image, but for so far short of where we should be. God has some work to do in our lives. Paul concludes this brief section on creation with a wonderful statement, 
in all things he might have the preeminence, that in absolutely everything he would have first place. Paul then re-emphasises the gospel, presenting it as both an encouragement and a challenge. You were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence, and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. Paul rejoices in his suffering, which he sees as filling up Christ's afflictions for the sake of the church. He rejoices in his suffering because the church benefited from it in some way. The New Testament never considers suffering for its own sake beneficial. For the true believer, fully trusting in Christ, there is always some larger redemptive purpose. I should remind you at this point that Paul had never been to this church, didn't know them personally, and yet his suffering still benefits the church. When we are fully gripped by Christ, we will live for the benefit or well-being of his church. To love Christ, the head, is to love the church, his body. So, in what sense did Paul's suffering fill up what was lacking in Christ's afflictions? Paul's sufferings complete Christ's afflictions not by adding anything to their worth, but by extending them to the people they were meant to save. All that is lacking from the cross is the infinite value of Christ's afflictions remains unknown and untrusted in the world. They must be carried to those who proclaim the word, and as they do, they fill up or complete what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ by extending them to others. The sufferings of Christ fully satisfied God's wrath, but there is lacking a personal presentation of Christ to the nations of the world. So Paul's suffering for their sake led to the gospel message coming to the Colossians. No wonder he rejoiced. Paul suffered for Christ's church because he was a servant and a steward of the church to make the word of God fully known. The central focus of Paul's life was Christ and his church. He was a servant and a steward of the church to make the word of God fully known. Paul's stewardship was to make the word of God fully understood by all those he reached, which he describes as the mystery that was hidden in ages past but now revealed to the saints. Paul was driven to keep the gospel moving forward, reaching new territory, covering new ground. Wherever he went, he made the gospel known. Paul explains God's plan to include the Gentiles in the new covenant that was not clear under the old covenant. Under the old covenant, to become part of the covenantal community, one had to become a Jew. They had to be circumcised, go to the temple, follow the law, participate in festivals, etc. In the Jewish mind, when the Messiah came, he would deliver them from their oppressors, in this case Rome. But Jesus' message was that all humanity are under much more cruel oppressors, those of sin and Satan. Both Jews and Gentiles can only be freed from this oppressor by faith in Jesus. Those who came to faith in Christ, Jews and Gentiles, form the church as the new people of God. The inclusion of Gentiles was so foreign to the Jew that it infuriated the Jewish leaders. 
Paul develops Jesus' teaching by saying that in Christ there is no longer any ethnic distinction between Jew and Gentile, and that the whole Old Covenant institution pointed to Christ and is fulfilled in Christ. Paul sums up this mystery as Christ in you, the hope of glory. Paul's aim was to disciple everyone through his teaching ministry. For this to happen, there is an objective work of the Spirit through the text or through teaching that gives light to the mind. There must also be a subjective work of the Spirit in our hearts. The challenge for all of us is that the human heart has a tendency towards spiritual dullness, So when we read the word or sit under teaching, we don't automatically get anything from it. Paul proclaims a person, saying we proclaim him. Christianity centres around a person and a relationship with that person. Paul proclaimed him in two ways, by warning and by teaching. He warned against incorrect thinking and behaviour. The flip side of teaching, reading and explaining the scriptures. Both are necessary, and yet this responsibility is not limited to teachers and leaders. All of us are encouraged to teach and to warn others. Paul gives us the reason he does what he does on behalf of the church. He works very hard to the point of exhaustion which he describes as struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Paul exhausted himself in ministry, yet in and through this exhausting work was the work of the Spirit energising him. Paul prays for the Colossian church to be encouraged in their faith to experience the fullness of Christ more fully. Paul describes having a great struggle. I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you. The word struggle there is where we get the English word agonize from, and it refers to strenuous work. What makes this struggle in prayer astonishing is that he doesn't know them. What kind of struggle is he talking about? I think the struggle is twofold. First, his struggle was a spiritual struggle pleading with God on their behalf because of the threat of false teachers. He feared the devastating and eternal consequences of this false teaching taking root in the church. Second, his struggle was because prayer is a form of spiritual warfare. Interceding, praying for others, is warring against the forces of evil. Sometimes praying for others is the most effective form of ministry you can have in someone's life. Paul prayed that their hearts would be encouraged. The heart is where faith springs forth. So he is praying that their faith be strengthened to face the opposition of the false teaching. He wanted them to remain faithful to Christ. He also prays that the church would be knit together in love. Encouragement comes as we grow closer together in love and mutual support. Love is the glue that holds community together when outside forces like false teaching threatens to disrupt. And since truth is what encourages our faith, Paul prays that the result of encouragement and growing in mutual support is that they reach all the riches of the full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He prays that they will be encouraged to grow in authentic community, so they have full assurance, that is, confident and fully convinced in their faith, which comes from understanding and centres on Christ. 
the goal of encouragement and authentic community is that we might experience the confidence that comes from increased understanding as well as a more profound and life-changing knowledge of Christ. There is so much to gain from being in genuine, open, honest, loving and truthful relationships with people that know God and know his word. His point is that if we find strength from each other, we will be more confident in our faith and experience the depths of, and of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge that is only found in Christ. Your spiritual growth, your confidence in your faith, the deepening your relationship with Christ require being part of an encouraging community of people. Paul then gives the motivation for praying, so that you are not deceived with good-sounding or reasonable arguments. Encouragement and being involved in community produces greater confidence in your faith and a deeper understanding of your faith and a greater treasuring of Christ which protects us from being deceived by false teaching. The most dangerous false teaching are those that sound like the real thing, reasonable and believable. As an apostle, Paul had a unique authority over the church, even though he didn't know them personally. His words carried weight because they were inspired by the Spirit, being the very words of God. So, as this letter was read in public worship, Paul's apostolic authority by the power of the Holy Spirit was present so the letter carried the same weight and authority as if he were there in person. Paul rejoices because he sees the fruit of his letter, their good order and the firmness of their faith in Christ. That is, they are spiritually in order and stable and will not be tossed around like the waves of the sea by this wind of false teaching. Paul looks at the subject of true freedom, beginning with the freedom from religious fakery. Don't let others spoil your faith and joy with their philosophies, their wrong and shallow answers built on men's thoughts and ideas, instead of on what Christ has said. In this context, Paul's next two sentences are easy to brush over, but are incredibly profound. First he says, for in Christ there is all of God in a human body. It's a clear statement of the incarnation, but it's actually more than that. This is not just some theological statement. Paul doesn't say this is God in human form, but rather this is all of God in human form. Since Jesus is restricted within a human body, it's easy to forget that this is all of God. And because of this, Paul can say, you have everything when you have Christ. As humans, we so often focus on the things we would like to have, what's missing from our lives to make them better. But Paul says, if you've truly grasped who Jesus is, and what it means to have him in our lives, then we would appreciate that we are lacking nothing. When we have him, we have everything. Paul then speaks of the freedom that comes from being delivered, a spiritual circumcision of our old sin nature. Freedom of knowing sins forgiven, with God making us alive in Christ. Paul says... God openly displayed to the whole world Christ's triumph at the cross, where your sins were all taken away. There is, then, freedom that comes from what only Christ can do. This leads to the freedom of not being bound by legalism. Paul says, since you died with Christ... This has set you free from following the world's ideas of how to be saved, by doing good, 
obeying various rules. Why do you keep right on following them anyway? Still bound by such rules as not eating, tasting or even touching certain foods. Such rules are mere human teachings, for food was made to be eaten and used up. These rules have no effect when it comes to conquering a person's evil thoughts and desires. They only make him proud. In what way does this yield pride? Because this is the sort of person that says, look at me. I don't do this. I don't eat that. I won't touch this. No spiritual benefit, but plenty of pride. Paul reminds the Christians to stay focused on who we really are and the true gospel that gives them hope that they originally believed in because they are sidetracked by the heresy of the Gnostic gospel. Paul reminds the Christians to keep on living out the transformed life rather than sinking back to the former life. Gnosticism emphasised personal spiritual enlightenment, Gnosis, where the inspired person believed their revelation to be more significant than any previous revelation, including scripture. What is the symbol of a life that is transformed by Jesus Christ? Paul says it is hope. In chapter 1, Paul had already told them not to shift from the hope promised by the gospel. Of course, a Christian can forget about their hope and live like a non-Christian. That is what Paul is seeking to avoid. Paul says, So, if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. The word for seek in Greek is zetaite, which means to put your heart on. So our seeking is not looking with our eyes, but hunting with emotion and passion. Fruitful living is a Christ-like living. We are created to be fruitful, and until we live out a fruitful life, we will never find satisfaction and fulfilment in life. But this kind of life is for those who have been raised with Christ. Paul says so, if you have been raised with Christ. This is to remind us that we were spiritually dead before we met Christ, and now we are spiritually raised with Christ, and looking forward to the future manifestation of bodily resurrection. That future is our hope. So Paul is saying that, since you have a new life, live like someone with a new life. Put your heart on the things that are above. It's not only the heart, it's the mind as well. Paul says, set your mind on things that are above, not on things on the earth. Set your minds is translated from a Greek word that literally means think on. Our searching for things above must involve both the emotion and the intellect. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul. Paul continues, for you have died and your life is hidden with God. Your life is now hidden with Christ in God. The word hidden doesn't mean that you can't find it, but rather it's securely protected, like a hidden file on a computer. As a resurrected being, we are in fact secure. In the next sentence, Paul says, when Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Christ is our life. Without Christ, there is no life. Even though, for now, this new life can only be perceived in our inner self, one day Jesus Christ will be manifested and we will also be revealed with him in glory. Chapter 3 gives us some real sound advice 
on true Christian living. Worship is a lifestyle, not a one-hour event. If you are a Christian, then a lifestyle of worship is the standard. It requires your heart, which should be focused on the throne of God, where Jesus is seated. It requires your mind, the intellect, the thought life. It requires the whole life. Christ is to be our life. He is to be everything to us. Paul says there are some things we have to put to death when we're baptised with Christ. Sexual immorality, impurity of both thoughts and actions, lust and any out-of-control appetite for worldly things, evil desires, greed. These are the clothes we wore before we became a Christian. But when you become a Christian, you must get rid of them and put on new clothes. Paul continues with more clothes we need to get rid of, anger and rage, malice, wanting something bad to happen to others, slander, filthy language, lying. Paul says these things need to die when you are immersed in Christ. When you become a Christian, everything changes. The old man dies in baptism and the new creature is born. You take off all the old clothes and put on new ones. This changing of clothes is a lifelong process. It doesn't happen instantly. Paul tells us that we are wholly set apart for God's use. God's love can transform us if we will let it. Paul has listed all the things we are to put off. He now lists the new things that we are to clothe ourselves with from now on. Compassion, which requires action. Compassion without action is just pity. Kindness, humility, realising who you are compared to Christ. Gentleness, patience, bearing with one another and extending the grace of God to others. Forgiving each other, for how can we expect God to forgive us if we don't forgive others? And love. Love should be like the overcoat of the clothes, covering everything else. Labels mean a lot in clothes. Particularly if you're trying to be in trend, you need the right label. Labels also mean a lot in spiritual clothes. If Jesus Christ is not on the label of your spiritual clothes, you're wearing the wrong clothes. When Jesus is on your label, you have peace and thanksgiving. Paul finished the section by giving us the keys to changing clothes. Bible study, letting the word of God dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with wisdom. Corporate worship, it's not the style of the song or worship that matters, it's the attitude of the heart. Service, Paul says, whatever you do, whether word or deed, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus. And prayer is obviously vital. The idea of the traditional family gets a bad press in today's society. One man, one woman, children. Personally, I wouldn't call it a traditional family. I call it a biblical family. Paul gives extensive instructions for the biblical family living in a godly way. One of the tragedies of modern life is too many Christians read their Bibles looking for loopholes. Does it really mean that? What about this? That's why it's important to remember the context of these verses. Paul had just said, Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Paul describing how husbands and wives, parents and children should relate to one another as believers who do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. He's describing the best case scenario, which means that what he's describing is a goal for Christian families to aspire to 
in our relationship with one another. The picture of the ideal Christian family given here by Paul is quite different from what is considered normal in ancient society. Many people, out of ignorance of history, do not realise how radical a departure Paul's instructions for the family here were, and have wrongly called Paul a chauvinist or anti-female. Nothing could be further from the truth. Christianity's elevation of the status of women was radical. Even more radical was its elevation of the status of children. Ancient society was organised in concentric circles, with the centre circle containing the highest value people, and the people in the outside circles having little to no value. At the centre was the freeborn adult male. Next came foreigners, then slaves, then the women, and finally the children. In Rome, for instance, a child's father had a right to kill him for whatever reason until he reached the age of adulthood. Early Christians rebelled against the practices of abandoning unwanted children and the sexual exploitation of children. This is the world that Christianity came into, condemning abortion and infanticide. Christianity's creation of children as treasured human beings was really an outgrowth of its most revolutionary idea, the equality and infinite value of every single human being. With these observations as a backdrop, Paul issues specific instructions for husbands and wives. He starts by saying that wives are to submit to their husbands. Very little could be seen as more offensive to our modern, assertive, rights-affirming, power-seeking culture than this instruction of Paul. But Paul isn't saying that wives are servants or slaves to their husbands. He says that to submit, in other words, unlike the way wives were treated in the ancient world of Paul's day, Christian women had a choice. And the choice they should make, Paul says, is to submit to a husband who is loving towards them. This instruction given to wives is also instructive to the husband. In the ancient world, the wife was the possession of the husband and he could do with her as he pleased, but not so in Christian marriage. The wife is there as a willing partner. Therefore, the husband cannot take her for granted, but he must treat her with love and consideration. Keep in mind that Paul is describing the best-case scenario, where the husband is wanting to live as a man of God. With this being the case, the last thing he needs is a wife who does not respect him or encourage him. The wife might indeed be the Bible scholar of the family. But if the husband is willing to lead spiritually, she should let him do so and support him, so he might develop as a godly leader. Godly leaders are not needed in the family, but they are needed in church and society. Paul says men are to relate to their wives lovingly, not harshly, as husbands did in the ancient non-Christian culture. Husbands are told to love their wives in a considerate way. In Ephesians, Paul tells us how husbands are to love their wives. While many wives revile against the instruction to submit, at least in part due to the pressure of society, I personally believe that women would have no problem with this if the man was totally and utterly loving towards her. Paul's next instruction is aimed at parents and their children. Children are to obey their parents and can do so assuming, as Paul is here, that the parents are guiding them out of love. 
Once again, we tend to focus on one aspect, and in our modern society, we rebel against it. But we miss what is actually the most important point. In this case, that parents love their children and treat them fairly, with tenderness and kindness. Paul counters the method of child raising in the day by calling on parents, with the Heavenly Father obviously setting the ultimate perfect example, to not embitter or discourage their children. Parents are to use discipline rather than punishment. Punishment is about inflicting a penalty, usually in a spirit of hostility and frustration, producing fear and guilt in the child. Discipline is for correction and maturity, given in a spirit of love and concern on the part of the parent. Parental expectations must always be appropriate, encouraging children to be their best. Paul is describing the ideal Christian family here. So these should be the goal for each of us in our family relationships. But what if things go wrong? Ask for God's forgiveness. Ask God to help you forgive yourself and others. Ask others for their forgiveness. And pray for the healing of family relationships and expect God to answer. We are called by God to stand out and be excellent at what we do. Paul says, whatever you do, work it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Notice the statement is universal. No matter what we do, whether for our family, church, work, school or community, we should give 100%. Excellence is not defined in terms of how we achieve greatness but on how we please God. Sadly, we would often rather compete with others than actually learning and reflecting on what we have contributed to our society or our church. Your passion and motivation will always be your drive to be the best at what you do, but your heart will always be the fire that will help you function in your dreams, aspirations, work, family, and anything that God asks you to do. Your focus should be on giving all your heart to every aspect of your life. As long as you know that you're offering your time, treasures and talents, God will continuously provide. God may sometimes give us the hardest challenges imaginable, but let's remember that he will definitely not leave us. We should learn how to wait, to listen, to look into what he is teaching us. We should be patient and enduring, for our Lord will always have a moral lesson for every situation, every experience and every aspect of our life. Let's stop complaining and start doing everything to the glory of God. It's so important that we never settle for less with our lives. Let us never forget that our God is ever powerful and that he will always provide. Motivation must always come from God. If you live your life centred on him, you will always have a direction and a core. Paul begins the final chapter with the challenge, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus encouraged his disciples to watch and pray with him as he contemplated the cross. Prayer changes your perspective. It changes the way you look at yourself and the world. Our first prayer should be that the Lord would give us eyes to see things as he sees them, to grant us his perspective. Prayer wakes us up to the spiritual realities around and within us. Being watchful and thankful. 
It's so easy when praying to spend all our time on our complaints and our requests. We bring to him the things that we want him to change. We have a negativity bias. We obsess over the things that are not right rather than obsessing over the things that are absolutely great. There's so much to thank God for. Life, health, family, friends, calling, mission, the goodness of God, the gift of his Son and of his Spirit, truth, faithfulness, constancy, forgiveness, the list goes on and on. Set aside the mental, social, physical and spiritual benefits of thankfulness. We shouldn't pray without thanking God, it's just wrong. Paul spends much of his prayer request and exhortation focused on effectiveness. Paul asks for prayer that he would be diligent and effective in his calling, even when he was in prison. Our prayer should be that we would walk in wisdom. Every calling is an opportunity to give testimony concerning God. If we do it well, in all things... Be effective, so your life creates opportunities to show people the goodness of God. Paul ends his letters with greetings from the people who were with him. Paul often ends his letters with personal greetings. If you read through the book of Acts and the letters that Paul wrote, you'll find he mentions the names of more than a hundred Christians who worked with him in his missionary efforts. You see, Paul was more than a soul winner. He was a friend maker. Eleven people are mentioned in this brief passage alone. Paul focuses first on those who were with him. There's a great deal of value in just being there. That's what these men and women did. They stuck with Paul through thick and thin. They didn't give up and quit. Tychicus and Onesimus were sent to the Colossian congregation to give a report. Someone had to go on Paul's behalf because Paul was stuck in a Roman prison. These men were Paul's spokesmen in Rome and now they would carry his report to the Colossians. Paul refers to both as both dear and faithful. Next, Paul mentions three Jewish brothers who stayed with him in his time of need. You can argue that the first of these, Aristarchus, stayed with Paul because he had no choice. He was a prisoner with Paul. But then he mentions John Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. If you remember in the book of Acts, Paul and Barnabas actually split up when Barnabas wanted to take Mark with them, but Paul didn't. This is such a lovely example that failure is not final. Mark is here back with Paul as a trusted co-worker. And the third Jewish brother is Jesus Justus, who also sends greetings, but about whom we know nothing else. Paul specifically says these three men were a comfort to him. These men shared his heritage as a Jew. And now they shared his commitment to the Messiah. It is delightful that when the church has people who will take part in being family to those in need. They take time to visit hospital patients and others who are going through difficult times. They have people into their homes and invest themselves in the lives of others. This is the way the church was designed to function. Ministry happens when members of the congregation give comfort and help where it is needed. Paul also sends greetings from a dear friend, Luke the doctor, and sends greetings to Nympha and the church in her house. Dr Luke helped Paul with physical ailments. Nympha provided her home as a place for the church to meet. Next on the list is a man called Epaphras. 
he would be what is called in in modern language a prayer warrior paul says that he is always wrestling in prayer that the church may stand firm in all the will of god mature and fully assured i vouch for him that he is working hard for you and for those in laodicea and hierapolis I don't think you can ever over-emphasise the importance of prayer in the church, and you should certainly never underestimate its importance. Prayer is not just one of the things we do at church. Prayer is the main thing we do. No no other organisation on earth has been given the responsibility to pray. If we don't pray as a church, I'm convinced that we hold God back from doing what he wants to do through his church. Everything we accomplish grows out of our prayers. The last person we're going to look at is a man called Demas. All Paul says about him here is Demas sends greetings. Demas is actually mentioned three times in the New Testament. In verse 4 of Philemon, He is called Demas, my fellow labourer. Then we have this reference in Colossians, where nothing is particularly said, either good or bad. But the third reference tells what became of Demas. Paul wrote the sad words to his dear friend Timothy in his final letter. Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. We don't know exactly what it was that tripped Demas up. Whatever it was, Demas took his focus off Christ and ruined his witness. Whatever else can be said about our life and work in the church, we need to face this truth. Many start well, but far too few end well. If you are looking for some encouragement, then it's this. Who is john mark he's the demas of yesterday and now he's back demas stands as a warning to all of us that it's not enough to start well we need to keep serving with love and grace to the end there's one final name in the list paul writes tell archippus see that you complete the work you have received from the lord That is an appropriate charge for every Christian, and therefore an appropriate point to leave this study in Colossians. If you would like to know more, then do contact us at any of the contact addresses given on this slide. Or, if you're in the Redstock area one Sunday morning, why not come along and join us for our half past ten morning service at the Baptist Church. You would always be very welcome.